Um, good afternoon, Sydney. A very early good morning from um, from Amsterdam, the Netherlands, or at least something that's in the Netherlands right now. Um, I'm going to start out the session. Um, I'm going to talk about the rise of software supply chain attacks, and we're going to hopefully answer the question like, how secure is your .NET application? So first, to briefly introduce myself, because that's always a polite thing to do when you start out a conversation with a big picture. It always scares me. So I'm Neil Stanis, and I work as a security researcher for Veracode. I got a background in .NET development, which means I started out my development career in the first bits of .NET, so that .NET version 1, 0, 1, 1. Um, I've done that for 12 years, and then I fully moved into the application security space where I was a consultant and also a pen tester ethical hacker. Um, and right now, with my current role within Vericode, I'm mostly focused on our static analysis capabilities for the .NET ecosystem. So it combines all the good stuff from, let's say, developing software, which I still enjoy a lot, and also breaking software and making sure that we can help other customers do the right thing. If you want to talk more about Vericode, come uh, see me afterwards or drop me a message on Slack because today, today's session will all be about software supply chain attacks and we're going to hopefully answer the question, how secure is your .NET application? I think if we look at the way that, the way that software development has changed, even for myself when I started out and how it's being developed right now, there's of course a lot like different, right? Um, also, the way that systems are being hacked and the way that um, people are able to hack systems and also hack the development process that's tied to that system, right? Because most of the companies will eventually become software, like companies, they will run on software. Um, it, there's a lot of uh, like, there's a lot of differences and that's exactly what we're going to cover based on the following agenda. First, I want to briefly touch some hacker history. Uh, because, of course, it's fun to talk about stuff and how stuff gets hacked. But I also want you to have some idea about how we ended up having the problems that I'm going to talk about right now. After that, we're going to define something which I call the software supply chain or a hypothetical software supply chain, which will be the subject throughout the rest of the presentation, which, of course, is related to the development of a .NET application. Um, what I'm telling today is mostly also agnostic for other languages. There's no real tie to technology stacks. It's it's, it's it's all applicable to everything. We've got to talk, of course, about building, releasing, and deploying software and all the steps that we need to take in between. And then the last part of the presentation, we will focus on, of course, how we can do a better job. How can we secure this? Um, and at the end, there will be conclusion and QA. Please feel free to drop questions in the room chat. That's fine. I'm going to keep an eye out on that one and opening it up. Uh, it's also... Um, also, and if it's if it's something I can answer right away, I will do, and otherwise I will keep it till the end. So, as I said, first up would be some hacker history, and let's move on. So, if you look into the history of hacking, and the first thing you will probably find is something related to freaking or phone hacking, and it's like the late fifties, late sixties, where people were producing uh, devices like this on the picture, which is a blue box that uh, allows you to emulate phone signals and allows you to make phone calls. And of course, that will be used throughout social engineering attacks where people trying to convince people to do things right and also to gain some stuff out of it. Uh, this is, I think, the first decade of, of, of hacking itself and it ended up like continuing, of course, until the early 90s, because in the early 90s, something different happened. Right. So, of course, we had systems. We had like systems that we used to run software on and also the Internet came around. So. The systems who are like before only constrained to a local network on a corporate environment, for example, or let's say university, now had a connection to the outside world, which also introduced tools like Satan, which is something that was created by Vitsa Fenema, a Dutch guy, and, and I believe US guy then called Den Farmer in 1995. And that is, as far as I'm aware, the first vulnerability scanner and an exploitation tool that will that can be used against a service that's connected to the internet. And of course, in 1997, um, another tool called NMAP was released, and that's that's short for Network Mapper, and that's something you probably will see nowadays if you have a company that will do a security test for you. The first thing they will probably do is assess the attack surface of the machine and see which way it's connected to the internet. 
and nmap is of course exactly doing that showing you like which ports are open which tcp udp ports are open from that server and from that perspective of course allowing the attacker to gain access to that machine and see if you're able to hack it so from phones to network connectivity to the next layer of hacking and that's of course something that's more related to layer seven or the application layer and that's the thing we're gonna of course talk more a bit more about so in 1997 a hacker by the name of LF1 wrote something, uh, an article inside of uh, Frack, which is a hacker magazine you can still find online. And the title of that piece is called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. This is the first article related to buffer overflows, where he explains, like a, he or she explains, um, if you have a buffer in C and if you write too much data in it then, and it won't fit, then you've got, of course, security issues. And the same some some way same stuff happened in uh, in the later edition in 1998 because then reinforced what we wrote for the first time about SQL injection and this is one of course which is still around um, and is, which unfortunately is still around a lot but um, the the example given that that's a uh, piece of the article and it explains like hey if SQL Server gets a statement and that can be manipulated then we can of course execute extra logic and do all fun stuff with it right so. We saw connectivity, we saw application layer problems pop up. And then in the early 2000s, the next evolution came, which is more related to worms and connectivity. And I can definitely recall both Code Red and SQL Slammer when I was starting out my development in these same years, um, which of course were a problems that were like worm and that were like propagating themselves. Code Red, as you see over here, this is the request uh, that was done by Code Red. It was a Unicode bug and then uh, not, not properly truncated, I believe, and therefore you could do code execution. But what the thing did is it, it also automated itself in a way that it will propagate and it will go search for other servers to infect in the same way. And that, of course, made it a lot more impact, right? Um, and a lot more, um, yeah, a lot more problems for a lot of more companies, right? So the evolution from this becoming more automated also um, uh, moved, or I'm not saying forced, but also decide Microsoft decided to start out the Trustworthy Computing Initiative, right? And Bill Gates sent out an email to all Microsoft employees telling that product security is important and security needs to come first if you develop software. So that's a small glitch of, of software evolution or like or hacking evolution. Let's also correlate that to a bit of software evolution, which I happily captured in one slide, but I'm just going to talk you through. So. When I started out my development in, in 2000, as I said before, um, I wrote monolithic applications. So applications self-contained single piece that will have all the logic. I would just hand it over the MSI to the customer I was working for saying like, hey, you need to install this on your machine and then you get to go and the internal users can use it. And of course, that, that was the first step. That was the monolithic approach. And if you wanted to scale that, that's something you see in the second, like, the second dot of this picture that you need to just deploy that monolith on multiple servers and then have some way of load balancing that. So there was much scaling and much like um, good scaling available for that. It was possible, but it took a lot. And also um, taking in the next step, maybe doing some backend services, right? With the ASMX or uh, maybe later on WCF. Um, unfortunately, the protocols were not uh, that good and uh, didn't allow us to scale. So if we then look, to the real evolution, then I think microservices will be the next step where smaller, far and fine-grained services will be created in a bigger landscape that make up the whole business process, right? And it also allows people to focus on smaller chunks and smaller services and redeploy on a far much more frequent fashion, right? There's no need to give that IT guy that MSI no, so it's probably all automated, right? And that's, of course, the biggest change, uh, similar if you then eventually move to a cloud native infrastructure and serverless, right? deploying Azure, Azure functions on, on the fly, scaling them, fending them out if, if needed. That's all automation, right? And in order to get from a software product and eventually something that it's deployed, it's something that we can also refer to as a supply chain. So there's one analogy I'm going to use across this presentation and that's related to the automotive industry because Aside from the fact that everybody probably knows how cars are being built, there are some good fixes in their supply chain that I think we should also move to software development. So if we look at a car supply chain, then at some point within the factory, the car starts out as a chassis, right? It's nothing like it's the base. 
And that's the thing that they will start building in the plant and it will go through step by step. And each of the um, step, it will be added products, right? That will be parts added and, and the car moves on into the factory. And at the end, it will roll off uh, the terrain and it will probably be sold to some consumer. That That's the, the, the whole chain from the start to the end. And in between each of the steps, like a bolt, parts will be added. Um, if we take a big Dutch, you know, I'm, I'm not saying Dutch, but if you take a big German car manufacturer, on average, a car has got like 10,000 parts that's being put on. And those 10,000 parts are being manufactured by 2,600 different suppliers. So 2,600 different factories will be delivering parts that will be put on that car before it rolls out the factory, right? So that's a lot of also inherently a lot of other supply chains that produce those parts that will be added to that car, right? So that's the analogy beginning from a chassis and a car rolling out of a factory. And if we then look to doing a parallel on software development, we can probably say like, hey, this is a software supply chain. And I this is the hypothetical one I just talked about, and it's just gonna be our main subject of the rest of the talk. Um, what we have inside of a software development supply chain is of course a developer that needs to write code that will be put inside of a, a git based repo for example in this case i'm i'm using the whole azure ecosystem but this is all interchangeable with of course github or gitlab for that matter it doesn't it doesn't make a difference right the problem will still be the same but there's a developer the developer will probably develop on top of third party libraries right because also myself as a developer i'm lazy i want to reuse stuff that others have done that makes it like a powerful concept, right? If everybody helps out. So packages will be fetched from third party uh, resources like NuGet, NPM. Maybe there are some Docker images involved, which you will get from Docker Hub. So there's, there are some moving parts in that era, area. Then once it's done, at some point, there might be a trigger that will make the Azure pipelines or the build process, in that case, picking up uh, the changes that are being made and producing the output and uh, in this hypothetical example, there's probably going to be a Docker image that will be built, that will be pushed to the container registry. Apologies. And then of course, being run by the Kubernetes service. And in the meantime, there will of course be test plans run on the binaries or on, on the artifacts itself, because we want to have some quality assurance, right? So in a nutshell, this is this is the, the, the process I'm talking to. We can probably create a much bigger one and a much complex one, but this is, the one that will be the subject and we're going to focus on on the different areas and identify some of the security issues and first i want to talk to you about if we look at the developer space like what's in a developer space that might um, allow an attacker to compromise the supply chain so starting out with your development machine of course the key thing in, in everything right so if you join a company um, um you'll probably get a machine provisioned for you right and there's hopefully an it department that will take good care of that machine in order to allow you to do your work most of the new hardware will probably have something like a secure boot or a trusted platform module installed on the machine itself meaning that you have some kind of guarantee that the software that's used to boot the machine in this case the firmware is not being tampered with and you can trust between quotes the machine. Secondly, uh, as I said, if it's a well-maintained machine, hopefully uh, the system updates will be installed on the fly. There's no need for you to worry about. Um, I've given this talk for the first time. During that talk, uh, my MacBook got updates pushed <laughs> on a dialog in the middle of my screen when I was talking about this. So that was a funny fact. But um, aside from that, of course, it's important to have a also hardened system, meaning uh, that it has the stuff installed that you need to do to do your job, but also not like anything you don't need, right? Because that will allow your machine to be even more vulnerable if there's not like properly configured, right? So that's the hardening part. And if you're doing stuff with source code, that's maybe intellectual property of the company or the, or the customers that you're working for, or maybe even of course, even worse customer data on your machine, then it's of course totally making sense to encrypt the disk um but the question that still remains if we can assume that this is all good um can we trust the hardware can we trust our hardware in our machines um can i trust my my chips that are in my macbook that's standing next to me right that's the question if you look into a presentation that was given by andrew wen also known as also known as bunny 
um, there probably will be, uh, the answer needs to be no. <laughs> and this is a, a real good talk, uh, which he's done at Blue Hat, which is Microsoft Security Conference held in Israel in 2019, where he talks about how s hardware supply chains are being hacked or how they could be hacked. And I think that's the, that's the biggest thing. So he talks about chip manufacturing and about like the different ways that stuff works out. And at the end, uh, if you're interested, you should definitely watch this, right? And it's also a bit like paranoid, but there's a lot of ways to hack the hardware, right? So are we completely sure we can trust our machine, right? Um, it, it's, a good, it's a good talk and it's also a part of the whole supply chain. So please um, make sure that you, like if you're interested, watch this session. I think it's totally worth it. And hopefully it doesn't scare you that much. So, um, let's say for now we can uh, assume that we have a, um, a machine that's trusted from hardware perspective. So as I said, I'm running a Mac myself. And if I want to install some tools to help me out doing my development, like let's say like a specific Python version, there's no real one to like go to shop from Apple that I can use, like say like I install this. Um, of course, we have the App Store, but that's different. That it won't contain uh, Python version X. Somebody else created Homebrew for that meta that allows you to install packages. Um, if you then go to the site, and this is the Git repo, if you then read out stuff you need to do, the first thing will say like, hey, you need to install Homebrew. And that's being done based by doing this command inside of a, a shell. And as you probably would see over here, it does say like, hey, I'm taking a bin bash shell and I'm taking the output of the curl that will get that installed shell script from GitHub. So what's inside that script, right? That's the thing you need to worry about. Am I blindly downloading the script and installing it on my machine? Maybe with uh, a lot of writes, um, that's questionable. Um, of course, there's always a way for you to say, okay, let me quickly peek inside, but I, trust me, if you look into the install script and try to understand exactly what's inside, that will take you some time, right? So there's some problem. You put a lot of trust inside of this, but uh, to be honest, I'm also using it myself because it's, it's it's a real easy way of installing the dependencies that I need at some point. If I run, run open VPN to connect to some server, then Homebrew will be the point where I go to. And people always say to me, okay, like, hey, that's probably only on a Mac, but if you run chocolately on Windows, then you're in the same space, right? Let me quickly go back one slide. It's similar and funny fact is if you go to their website um, and they talk about install, they even give you the disclaimer for the problem I just talked to you about. Like, okay, you, t you take this PowerShell script that you will execute on your Windows machine. Uh, you can trust us that they are safe, but are we really sure that that's the case? Um, so it, it's always good to verify this, this script that you download from the internet. That's what they're saying here, right? That totally makes sense. So. A lot of parts being moved in um, with this way. And um, if we have our machine, the hardware, and then the tools that we install, what will be next if a, a developer starts out doing its job, then it needs to, he, or he or she needs to have an IDE to do, to do uh, work, right? Um, but it can happen to IDEs. So in May of this year, uh, people from the GitHub security team published um, a piece of, of, of published an article about something called the Octopus Scanner malware, which was targeting the NetBeans IDE. Uh, and the NetBeans IDE can be used to develop Java and each of the jars that was being built with an infected NetBeans IDE would have a malware dropper inside of it. And that was done all over the time. So pretty sophisticated um, attack. And keep in mind that um, so every package that was produced by that IDE um, is compromised, right? So because its supply chain is compromised and one of the tools that was used, Net, NetBeans was compromised. Um, this was something pretty sophisticated and you can also question yourself, like, hey, why would they, why would somebody do this in this way? Uh, because it's like targeting a specific IDE and why not focus on targeting a build server, right? Because a build server will probably be used to produce packages that will be released. And that will have a lot more, let's say, um, a lot more effect. There's a lot more to achieve with that. Uh, so there's a lot of questions. And uh, the GitHub people also mentioned, like, hey, this is probably not the only way that this was being done. There's probably multiple ways. And it's really a, a targeted piece. Um, but this was a NetBeans, right? So Java, IDE. But if we then correlate back to the IDE that I use a lot and that I'm really a big fan of, that's VS Code, um, there are some implicit problems with VS Code also. Um, 
and, and don't get me wrong, I'm going to just like bash a, a bit, but um, VS Code itself is, of course, built on top of Electron. And this side that you're seeing the screenshot over here is a tool that allows you to create a dependency graph of Electron NPM package, right? So that's that's the thing that will be used by VS Code to run. That's also the same engine that will run the Slack that you're looking at right now, right? That's all Electron. There's a lot of tools that are relying on this. But if you then have that dependency graph, including the transitive dependencies, right? So that's like the second layer dependencies, as you see over here, the diagram is a lot bigger. Then we need to like, then we can see that there are 82 dependencies in the whole electron system that will be used by VS Code, right? VS Code is even a code base that's built on top of that. So those 82 packages has got 110 maintainers. So 110 people are responsible for each of these packages that are below. And these are even only the maintainers, that those are not the con contributors, right? And I think you can even have like a couple of thousand contributors below that, that will help out the maintainers delivering those packages. So a lot of people are touching that code that eventually ends up in your VS code, uh, in that instance that you're executing, or even in that Slack window that you're looking at right now. And it's something to be aware of that there is a big chain. And if one of these packages gets compromised and their supply chain gets compromised, which we will see an example later on, then that also means that the things that you're doing or the packages that you're building throughout the IDE, the stuff that you're doing is compromised. Um, and of course, no uh, VS code itself and Electron has got its own issues, right? There was, there was an issue in 2018 about, uh, with node integration that could be bypassed. You could just like talk to the node engine directly with the remote ex code execution as a result. And even more recently, I think this is, it was August of this year, um, this was a JSON remote execution problem within VS Code. Uh, some packages JSON format allows you to do a, I think, a, a on on Hoover of a file inside of VS Code that will execute this. Um, and in I think April of that year, there was also a problem with the Python extension, right? So even with VS Code, even with Electron, there's also a big ecosystem of extensions, right? There's no uh, language that hasn't got support for VS Code, which makes it a really good tool that a lot of people use, but also makes it a valuable tool to attack, right? Uh, that's that's just coming with that whole uh, thing. Um, even this, uh, fixing this problem is hard. So this is a screenshot I took yesterday or the day before, um, which is an issue you can find on GitHub that, that points out that the fix that they did for that CVE I just shared. So CVE, that's the publicly known identifier for a security problem, right? CVE, every vendor or like can use CVEs to identify problems. And in this case, um, there's no explanation of like, hey, the fix that's been done, it's not completely covering the problem. And the guy even put in, I think, a pull request to get that fixed. So that's really cool, right? That's also the power of community-driven development. So a lot of people look at the code and can participate and help out. But there's also a lot of problems that can arise by IDEs that get compromised. And if there is something to gain, then attackers and hackers will definitely do that, right? So we talked about <clears throat> development machine and we can mark off that piece. Maybe I should put a green mark in this deck that we're like, we can say like we can assume that we can trust our hardware to that degree and we have installed the software and the machine is maintained. So now let's focus on developing software and writing code. And that of course relies on putting stuff into a source repository and also talk to package managers like NuGet or NPM to get the dependencies that you need. And if we then look at the development machine and the way that it communicates with package managers like NPM or NuGet, there's a key thing that we use in order to safeguard the things that we do on the internet, right? Which is of course TLS transport layer security that will allow us to create secure, like secure communications with uh, with an end server. Um, the system itself is built on top of a root authority trust, right? So there's a certificate that will, uh, that's a root certificate that will um, hand out certificates for others to use. And that's the whole trust system. And of course, it has its own issues. Um, if you look into um, SSL labs by Qualys, you will find a trap model related to these types of systems. And it's a big one. And we've even seen like a Dutch instance of the Dicky Nota case where a root CA was compromised and all the effects it had on, on the internet as a whole. Um, I'm, I'm referring to, to links and to slides. So um, all this, the things that I'm referring to are in the notes 
of the slides and those slides will be available in my GitHub uh, repo at the end of this presentation. So you can just like sit back, relax, uh, have the links later on. But um, <clears throat> so that, that, that that's a, that's the thing to keep in mind. Also, there were problems with TLS 1.0 and 1.1, which were like the poodle, uh, the, the beast and the heartbeat attacks, right? Which were uh, attacks that allow people to um, um, see network traffic or determine the traffic that was sent over the wire. Luckily for, let's say, NuGet as a repo, uh, they downgrade it or they do, do, don't allow you to use the TLS 1.0.1.1 anymore. I think last year, November, they turned it off for the first time. I think it was April of this year, 2020, that they fully shut it down, which is a good thing. So you're not like vulnerable to that anymore because also with TLS and keeping it compatible, um, compatibility is, of course, a big problem in the whole security space. Second, on top of that, if we communicate to a, a machine that's on the internet, we need something like a DNS or a domain name service to translate the fact that we want to go to NuGet or the fact that we want to go to GitHub, and that needs to be translated back to an IP address in order to connect to it. Um, it has its own problems, but there is a countermeasure you can take, which is called DNSSEC, that will do some signing of uh, DNS responses for you that will allow people to check the authenticity of a DNS response. Unfortunately, both NuGet and GitHub don't use DNSSEC. So if at some point somebody is able to spoof them, then um, it can be redirected to another IP address. Of course, then hopefully TLS will still pop in and say like, hey, this is a certificate that you cannot trust, but there are there is still possibilities. And I think if they turn it on, that will be a good additional countermeasure to take. So, Development machine communication, let's put a green mark behind it and say, like, we can trust it right now. Um, what do we then need? And that's, of course, credentials to connect to our source repo. Um, this is an article of July of 2019 um, where it's being talked about that Canonical's GitHub account was being hacked. And I think it was just ordinary credential theft, so stolen credentials. And Canonical is, of course, the company or like the, the project that runs Ubuntu, the Linux distribution. Um, at the time of this writing, the second title, I always like find it funny to read. It's like, so the Ubuntu source code appears to be safe. However, Canonical is still investigating, right? So that that's, of course, if somebody at some point in time has got access to source code, it will be a hell of a job to trace back if there's any changes that will affect the product, right? That's a, that's a hard thing to do. Um, so that that's happened. That's happening to Canonical. And we'd like, do, have, do other companies suffer the same? Oh, yes, they do. So... This was, I think, July, July or June of this year, where um, it turned out that also some credentials were stolen and a hacker group was able to get like 500 gigs of a private repos from Microsoft and they tried to sell it on the black market. So ordinary credential theft or being able to access a, a, um, a source repo, what can we do in order to reduce um, that type of risk, of course, is using multi-factor authentication on the systems that you're communicating to, right? So if you're using GitHub, this is a bit of blurry screenshot. I need to replace it. So it's um, it's it's giving you an additional like factor in your authentication uh, dance in order to get like connected, right? So you type in username and password and you also need to have that code that will be rotating throughout time, the additional factor. So even if the credentials get stolen, then this additional factor will still give you some guarantee that the account cannot be accessed, right? And on top of that, if we look at a Git-based system, there's an additional way of dealing with changes. Um, it's also something called Git commit signing, where you take a public-private key pair and the developer can sign the commit that he or she is doing with a private key pair and that can then be validated against that public key pair. Um, and that will then show up as verified in Git, as you see over here. Um, so that's even an additional layer of defense, right? An additional factor, even if your credentials get stolen or if even if somebody was able to get that OTP code that you're using, then um, this will still distinct something good from something bad because he, he the hacker probably hasn't got access to that private key that uh, is used to sign the commits, right? So additional factor. So this marks off the communication to a source repo, let's now move on to the next thing, which is consuming third-party libraries. And this is something that happened in November of 2018 with a, an NPM package called EventStream. Um, 
turned out that uh, it was compromised in a way that it would affect uh, a 2 million weekly download package of NPM. Um, the, the background story behind this is that this package was pretty stale and it's also, I think, inherently to NPM as a whole. There's just a lot of small packages that make up the whole system. And as we have seen with Electron, there's a, there's a big chain of dependencies you will get in. This was a pretty minimal package, but a lot of other packages relied on this one. That's 2,000 other packages, which will then result in that 2 million downloads a week, right? So this package is a transitive dependency of 2,000 other libraries. Turned out that the attacker was not so sophisticated because it was a person that eventually became a maintainer on the project and um, he or she um, decided, like, did some work on it, pushed some changes, which were good, and then decided to install uh, some malware that was targeting a specific Bitcoin currency wallet uh, on the system. So not so sophisticated, but um, it was compromised, right? So. Um, Keep in mind that even if a package that you use inside your software that will be used on a development machine or on a build server later on, if that package is compromised, it means that your software supply chain is compromised as a whole. So let's move on to the next stage and let's talk about building, right? Which in this picture would be the Azure pipelines icon and all the stuff it's doing. So we can do the whole dance with hardware and vendor trust in this particular meta. So Similar things apply, like, hey, um, I'm using a build server, there's hardware in it, or even if I'm using some build agent in a cloud environment, then can I trust the vendor doing the right thing? We also still have all the TLS issues I talked about before. And if we build top on, on top of Docker images, then it's not unseen that Docker images have been compromised in the past. Um, funny fact is when I was creating this slide deck for the first time, I was looking into like, hey, what does Docker do in order to secure um, access to Docker Hub. Turned out that two-factor authentication is available, but it's in beta and it still is in beta. I checked it yesterday. So um, I've been unfortunate. Hopefully it will be mainstream for everybody or hopefully there are better ways, but um, th 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 that can still be a, a problem, right? And also be aware of the fact that build server or any of the SDKs that are being installed on the build server can also be compromised. And an example, which I think originated from, I think like the early 2000s is something that happened to uh, the Xcode SDK, and which is also uh, uh, like known as the Xcode ghost. And what, what happened is that within, um, um, because of the fact that I think like in Asian area, uh, internet wasn't such a, let's say, well covered compared to, let's say, uh, in, in the Netherlands, um, they usually share software on different spots. And at some point, uh, one of the spots where you can download the Xcode uh, had a version of the Xcode SDK that was compromised that had malware inside of it. And that malware was then, of course, being embedded in each of the uh, iOS apps that were being built with that SDK. I think eventually there even were a set of apps that were affected by this. Um, so by just targeting that SDK, having uh, some way of distributing it, right, because of the fact that people have mirrors to download that SDK um, allowed somebody to, to gain access and to drop some malware inside apps. And similar thing happened in July of this year to a SDK that's uh, delivered by Twilio. Uh, it turned out that one of their JS SDKs had a file inside of it, which was compromised. And um, the way that it even happened is that this SDK at some point grabs files, content files from an S3 bucket and embeds it inside the SDK. It turned out that that S3 bucket on AWS wasn't fully locked down, resulting it in a, a file being replaced by somebody. I think it was noticed really quickly, but it was still possible, right? Um, and with that file being replaced, uh, that SDK was compromised. So technically speaking, each of the versions that was built or the, like each of software that was written against this SDK or with the help of this SDK, should be assumed compromised. Um, if we then move on and then look more, let's say like at build server level. Um, so um, I think it was 2019, in the AppSec Village at DEF CON, somebody talked about a Webmin, which is a web-based tool um, that had one of its build servers compromised. And it had its build servers compromised for more than over a year, I believe. Um, so they had like a hosted machine that was being reused to produce all these versions. 
and um, that, that thing got compromised and somebody embedded some additional artifacts inside the output that was like eventually the installer of Wabin. Uh, and it was noticed, right? So it, it took back, um, like it was like, a, a, there's a range of versions that was compromised in this way. So even if we have all the stuff in place that I talked about before, we've done the best job with Git, uh, access our machines, all our communication infrastructure. And if we are like pretty certain, still if that build server that's building the software that will be released is compromised, then the supply chain is compromised. So a uh, pretty nice story. And I, uh, there's probably a video around, I'm not sure if I put this in the links, maybe I should add it about like how this happened because there's a whole like investigation done like how long uh, was this uh, server compromised, right? Because you want to trace back and tell everybody that's using it, like, hey, you need to update. That's of course a, a lot of work, right? So let's uh, recap a bit what I talked about and um, let's see if we can um, like identify more problems, right? So most of the things that I just talked about are like pinpointing a specific area in the supply chain related to building or developing software. There's still also a lot of moving parts, right? So packages are moved over, packages are being stored, intermediary stuff happening. And there's even, uh, to a certain degree, no guarantee that the source code that's being pushed by the developer to that repo is eventually also the source code that will be inside that package or inside that piece of software that you're using. That's a, that's a, a hard question to answer, I think, because it will be hard because there's a lot of moving parts in between. Um, but could you go up to uh, NuGet and then say like, hey, I'm grabbing Newton software JSON and I'm gonna build the DLL and I want to make sure that the DLL is exactly the same as the one that's in my new, inside my NuGet package. Um, I think the problem that that will be hard because there's a lot of things that's in between in order to get that binary that will make it hard. And one aspect of it is something called reproducible or deterministic builds. So taking source code from any, let's say, library or piece of software that you're using and building it in the same way that it's exactly the binary that you're executing, because that will give you the guarantee of, hey, this is really the software that, I'm, that I want to run and there's no compromise being done in between. So one key aspect of the whole problem we had before is uh, builds being reproducible. Given the same source code, as this, uh, as this definition says, um, build instructions, we can create a bit by bit identical copy of a DLL, right? That's, that's the thing. Um, I believe even um, uh, Mark Rosinovich in his last talk at RSA on supply chains, definitely one to, to look into if you're interested in this a bit more. He also told that parts of Windows are being deterministic reproducible right now, but it's still a hard job to cover uh, and to do that in a consistent way. Luckily for us, if we're doing .NET development, uh, starting with Roslyn V11, they have some kind of determinism inside of it, that um, the way that the compiler emits um, outputs and allows you to have some guarantee. So um, what they state is that given same inputs, the compiler output written will always be deterministic. And inside this note, there's a link to a design document on GitHub that will allow you to identify what the inputs are of uh, the build, right? So it's not only source files, it's also uh, the SDK bits and pieces that are installed, uh, folders that stuff is being uh, copied from, right? Those all have influences on the eventual output. There's even um, some stuff inside the PE header of the DLL that will like be different each time you compile it. And luckily, uh, there is a, a MS build argument slash de deterministic that will take care of it. The .NET Core will do this by default. Um, so there is an ability for you to do exactly the same but based on the conditions that those inputs are the same, right? So yes, it's possible. Um, I look into those input documents to determine if it's um, if there is a moving part compared to what it is. And there's even projects that approach it in a way that aside from source code, you can also grab a mutable um, build environment for a package that's being built up for you exactly in the way that the project is being built, right? So that allows you to verify, which is, uh, pretty cool. I think uh, a project is called Gideon. It's done by, I think, uh, a cryptocurrency project um, that, that that has that as a goal that will even allow you to build up a build environment to build the source code to verify it. And that will be the next step, right? 
So this is just a small bits and pieces that we need to cover. So let's now assume that with .NET and if with our building our applications, we can do re reproducible builds and be deterministic in the output that we get. We're still going to move a bit back to the automotive industry and get some parallels out of that. Because as I said in the, at the beginning, they have solved some of these problems in a really good way. Um, so the picture you see over here is something that's being published in, I think, a German or Dutch car magazine, where they take down, tear down a car that has been driven 100,000 kilometers, and they will look at each of the parts to see how they fold it together, right? Or if there's any wear and tear that might be bad to that car. So we've probably all been in the space where um, we get a recall from the car vendor or our dealership saying, okay, you need to get your car back to the garage because one of the parts has got an issue on it and we want to replace it in order to safeguard your safety, right? So if there's something wrong with my seat belt, then I would definitely go back to my garage and get it replaced, right? Um, so for some reason, car, the car industry, the automotive industry is really well capable of identifying the parts that are inside your car, right? And that's of course uh, tied to the way that they deal with their supply chain. and. I'm going to do another hypothetical supply chain in relation to car manufacturing and let's move let's look into this and see how that can be how they solve this um so this is a, a supply chain related to disc brakes and that are being used on different models of cars and disc brakes of course start out as, as steel right at some point and the tata steel factory which is one based over here in the netherlands could have taken iron ore that came from sweden and then produced steel out of it right um, they probably will do all the quality assurance they need, make sure that it's all tested and certified, and then that batch of steel will be distributed across all their um, customers in order to use it. And hopefully that batch will be identifiable with a batch number. Um, let's say that steel then ends up with the Bosch uh, manufacturer, um, and Bosch produces a lot of car parts for a lot of the different brands. And let's say they, take, they took that steel, they created the disc brakes out of it, which of course also uh, tick their boxes, right? They want to make sure that it's tested and certified in the way that it's supposed to be. They put down a serial number with that disc brakes saying like, hey, this is the serial numbers and we're gonna distribute it across Ford, Volkswagen and Kia. They will use this disc on one of their models. And then in the car manufacturing plant when the Ford car gets like uh, constructed and, and put together, then all those parts end up in the car, right? So that will be the disc brakes, but that will also be the exhaust, that will be the tire. And then those are all like identifiable in a way that they know what the origin is of that piece that's being put on that car. And that will eventually make up a car with a vehicle identification number, right? Um, and that allows them to correlate back. So if at some point in time, Tata Steel needs to conclude that the batch of steel that they produced for batch number one, two, three, four has got some problems because it turned out that after X years, there are some cracks in it and it's not good, then they can correlate that back, right? They can correlate that back to um, the fact that, hey, these disc brakes were being produced out of it and they were being put on that car. And if we look at a whole, and if we look at the car automotive industry, this is, a, this is a way how to fix it. And even big companies have recognized that this is a way that we need to like move into. Uh, Google, Microsoft, they're all into this saying like, hey, we need to have something called the software bill of materials or an S-bomb that will allow us to describe the products and the, the the intermediary products we have for our um for our um could, could you please mute yourself if you just joined the session because there's a, some some feedback on on the line so um it allows you to describe the parts that are being used right so it should be an industry standard that's describing the software that allows you to identify the producer What's the product, right? Can we have something to say about the integrity of the project? Is it an audit or not? Uh, how was it created? With source code, you could say like, hey, uh, uh, with a piece of software, like what source code was used? What type of materials was used in order to create this? Um, this is still something that's in the making. There are some initiatives starting out, um, something which is pretty hands-on and which is something they call a lightweight S-bomb is uh, a tool called Cyclone DX that will allow you to create a full dependency graph as we've seen before with VS Code, right? So the full transitive dependency graph of a piece of software allowing you to identify which third-party libraries are inside your app and allowing you to say like, hey, uh, there's a CVE being published for this library that I'm using. 
uh, I'm using it in these apps within our organization. We need to take action on these two because that's a big risk. And the other ones can just like go in the normal update cycle of that project. So allows you to, to instrument in the same way that the car manufacturer would recall a car, right? Um, Cyclone DX itself originated from OWASP dependency checker. And uh, if you're interested in, I think they, they vary in all the stacks that they support. So that's Java.net, JS. Uh, there's a lot um, that, that can be done. And there's another source, uh, which is the National Telecom Authority in the US, which is the NTIA. And there's a, there's one guy on the team that does a lot with for bill of materials, and he has written down some um, good articles on what it should contain. And it's still like an ongoing process uh, where a group of people meet up and uh, to work on the standard. So if you're interested in that, you should definitely move into that direction and, and look into that way. So this is all a hypothetical speaker, but are there already ways that we can uh, do uh, this and yes there is and i should have taken out that footnote of this slide um i'm sorry about that but i'm going to show you uh, a tool which is called in toto and in toto is being created by the university of new york and new jersey that will allow you to secure the integrity of software supply chains and i think this is a pretty powerful concept to use that will solve some of the problems we've seen in the slides before on your software so I'm quickly move on to the next slide. We're gonna do a demo, and that's nice. We got like ten minutes left, so that's cool. Um, we're gonna we're gonna dig into in total, and I just want to briefly touch some terminology on the things that I'm gonna cover in the next ten minutes. Um, so, in the whole chain, we have something called functionaries, and functionaries are people that participate in the supply chain. So there's me, the project owner, and there's a developer involved and a packager, and all of these. Functionaries are being identified with a public and private key pair, and they will sign stuff on the way with that private key, and you can validate with the public key if that's the thing that really originated from that like role in that case. Myself, I'm going to define the supply chain as a project owner, a layout that will describe what happens in the supply chain by who, and what will be the materials and produce materials and byproducts, meaning that if a builder or if a developer checks in source code, then that can be identifiable by saying that's this tag on Git or that's this set of files, and that will also be signed by that uh, by that uh, by that functionary, and you can validate that. And then all of these steps will produce metadata files, which we'll see in the demo, and that metadata files will then end up being verifiable. We can verify that metadata and say like, hey, if somewhere in between one of these steps. Is the software supply chain compromised or not? So let's move on and let's go to VS Code because you've listened to me talking a lot and showing you a lot, but now we're gonna do some, some demos. So this tool um, is installed on the machine, it runs on Python. And let's first look at some of the layout stuff that I created. So first, because I'm the project owner, I want to create a layout file that I will allow to describe um, the steps. And one of the first steps that the developer would do is to create a project, right? So this is a real small demo. It's not nothing fancy, uh, but it will create a program CS file. That will be the output. That will be the artifact. We will drag through the whole supply chain. That's being that's being written down. There's uh, stuff being mentioned like, hey, these are the export expected projects. And this is being done by this functionary. It needs to be signed by somebody with that functionary. And it will have the... Uh, public keys inside of it. So let's quickly create that, which is a Python script that you just see before, and it's inside the project owner folder. Demos, I need to go into internal demo, and then we have owner. Let me run Python, create layouts. It will create this root layout file that will have exactly the stuff that you've seen. It only has replaced the public uh, keys of all the functionaries involved. And I'm going to put this inside the folder, right? We're going to gather all the artifacts of all the steps that are being done. So next up would be like the developer starts out developing. And that will be a developer with the name of MA. And what she will do is she will just like create uh, the project. And I just created some bash scripts in order not to to uh, mess with the demo gods, but um, in total itself allows you to do a step 
And in this case, I'm going to say like, hey, I'm going to record a step that I'm going to do, which will be signed by MA. And the action that, that she's doing is just like creating a new console and the products that are being produced is the CS file and it will be signed by the developer. And that's exactly what happened right now. So there's a source folder being created, the project is the app folder and there's a link file. Let's copy the link file to the end product folder because we're going to need it in order to check it. And let's say the developer right now is done and passes on the project to the next functionary in the chain, which will be the packager and that's not. So let's move on. He picks up the source code from the Git repo and has it locally on his machine. And let's say he needs to do his work on the machine on the package before it's uh, being released. First, what thing he's going to do is a publish, which will take the project and it will publish the output to a folder that will contain the binaries. And then the last step would be a package, which will take up the, the binaries itself and it will create a gzip tar out of it, right? So uh, first is publish, which is nothing more, nothing less like a publish of a .NET app that will still have, that will identify that it needs to have materials from the previous step, the program she has, right? That's the one that the developer produced. And it will have a product that will be inside the published folder. And that will then have a gzip end product. So this is the binary or release binary. And let's put the link files in. And now we're able to verify that. So let's go to the final product. And I need to have my public key also in there in order to verify it. So it's funny to see that I did these projects contain both public and private keys. I always get a slam of email from GitHub saying like, hey, there are keys inside this package. Yeah, that's the whole purpose of this demo. But it's good that they point you out that there are like maybe private keys that you don't want to expose into your source repo. So final product, right now we can ask in total to verify it. And if I verify, um, if to verify all the steps and this is the texting. So I'm going to say like, Hey, this is the layout. These are the keys that the layout has been signed in, which is my public key. And let's do a verbose thing. And what we will see then is a lot of stuff happening, but the end conclusion would be, Hey, the software product passed all verification. So the software supply chain we have. Uh, wrote written down um, who has has we, we all the checks are good right and of course the demo won't be complete unless there is a hack and that's the thing that we're going to do next so there's a hack script and all these demos are in the GitHub repo you will see at the end you can run them yourself uh, then the hack will just clean up to a certain state let's just say at some point now or are we supposed to be only a packager decides to alter the software right so maybe uh it's um, it's it's or it's it's a piece of software that's installed on his development machine, right? One of the things that we talked about before in this whole chat. Um, and let's say that, and let's then say, and now is uh, I need to go to now it's folder. Let's say uh, now does his thing, right? So he does the publish again, and he does the package again. So now we have those artifacts again, similar to what we have seen before when it was verifying in a way that it was saying it was good. So let's move this one to published. Let's take the tar. I'm not saying published. I need to have this one on a higher level. I'm screwing up a bit here over here. So this one can go back to now it's folder. I don't want that one. Okay, so right now we only have the artifacts in the folder that we're like uh, that we want to check. And if we now go to final product, hopefully it didn't screw up. And if we then do the in total verify again, as we've seen before, then we will see that it has a problem because it mentions that there is a, a, a mismatch in source file that was being pushed and signed by the developer. And that was then being packaged by the packager and then it was altered in the way, right? So now we have a good guess of like, hey, at that point, that stage, that source file was compromised. And we can take action on that. So let's move back to the slides. Um, as I said, I think this is a pretty powerful demo and I'm going to wrap up because I've only got a couple of minutes left and I also want to open up for questions. If you want to see a good real world example of Intoto being used, I would encourage you to look into Datadog's blog where they explain how they use in Toto to verify their agent builds of their product, which is really cool. They exactly show all the concepts that they apply and then 
to have some verification of the supply chain of those agents. Um, if you run on Google, there is Graphius and Credus, which are like two services within the Google Compute pl pl uh, Cloud Platform that will already allow you to consume in total metadata artifacts. And um, binary authorization can even be a decision tool for you to say like, hey, assess the software supply chain artifacts that I have, and then allow you to publish your app to uh, like, de like um, deploy your app or not, right? And similar things can be achieved with the Azure Ad Artifacts policy. Right now, this only can like at the state uh, Docker images say like, hey, this port is open, or yeah, you can and it, you can like check all those things. But I think this will be the spot where Intoto fits in in that whole story, where you can verify Intoto and then uh, also take actions based on outputs. So let's wrap and let's let's wrap into the conclusion. I think it's important for for you as a developer or like a, within your organizations to be aware of the software supply chains i just talked about i know there's a bit of paranoia in it but that's that's just how it like comes together right i think the biggest key thing is to be aware of what you're pulling into the projects that you're building and also what's been done for the software supply chain right in the ideal world every open source project will also give their supply chain artifacts to you so you can verify it right uh, this product may contain gluten, right? That's a thing that's been put on on our food products that we have, and I would like to see similar things for uh, for software like this. Might use this library, so that for that reason, it might be vulnerable. If I want you to take one thing out of this presentation, is please use M MFA on all your accounts, integrate security into your development lifecycle, right? That's the thing that we are doing with Vericode. Also, security should be in from the start, and learn more about software bill of materials and see if there's any small bits and pieces you can get together, like the Cyclone DX I talked about, to get your software into a better shape. So, thanks. And with one minute left, I'm going to check if there's any question on the chat. Um, so, there's the GitHub repo that contains both the slides and the demos that I talked about. You can reach me on that email address. And, of course, I'm on Twitter. So, feel free to unmute yourself right now if you've got any questions, or otherwise, I'm going to say, um, Enjoy the rest of the day on what's left of, of NDC and hopefully uh, see you next time.